My name is Asa, and I'm from the Worcester Roots Project and our youth worker cooperative, the Toxic Soil Busters. Uh, we're just going to go around and introduce ourselves. All right, my name is Jonathan Rodriguez de la Cruz Jose Siquera, and I used to be part of Toxic Soil Buster, and yeah. Hi guys, I'm Haley. I am a current member of Toxic Soil Busters. I actually joined just a little, little while ago, a couple weeks to a month, and I'm not going to get back. Shane, you want to introduce yourself? I'm from Youth in Charge, which is a sister organization to uh, Toxic Soil Busters. And I'm wearing a lot of hats today. I'm also here representing Future Focus Media Youth Cooperative and Training Institute. Uh, we're going to explain <coughs> all these different organizations in a second, but first I want to talk about youth cooperatives. Now, we can talk about the youth cooperative movement. But right now, it's not much of a movement. It's just a few experiments that are happening <laughs> in like a small, isolated parts of the country. So what I really want to get out of this is seeing uh, a movement come out of these kinds of conferences and have those kinds of connections built across the country and even just starting a dialogue about what the role of youth is in the workplace democracy movement. Um, so first question is why youth cooperatives? For me, it's an alternative to more hierarchical, top-down structures of youth service programs in which youth are brought into the program and then somehow fixed or rehabilitated or um, brought into those kinds of skills. It's more of a youth empowerment. So you, the key word for me is not youth services, but youth empowerment. Asking youth what they want to create, what structures and um, ways of changing their communities that they have in mind. Because youth aren't just receptacles for knowledge and adult experience and adult wisdom to be poured into, but rather fountains that have to be uh, cleared away, have the leaves, leaves raked away so that they can express themselves and come into the uh, role that they see they have in their community. Uh, we're going to show a short video about one uh, cooperative that we started in our city of Worcester, Massachusetts to sort of fulfill that kind of broader mission. And it's called the Toxic Soil Busters, and we're going to show it to you now. Worcester, Massachusetts, the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. Worcester's factories made barbed wire and machine parts. They made textiles and corsets and even invented the envelope folding machine and the monkey wrench. With so many factories springing up and immigrants from all over the world coming to work, Worcester became the birthplace of three-deckers. To save money, the owners chose the strongest paint they could find. They chose the low cost of long-lasting lead paint, and the paint did last. Decades later, a new generation of immigrants now occupied Worcester. While the old factories are abandoned and their jobs gone, the lead from paint lives on lurking in the soil. That's why we're taking things into our own hands. I'm Janice Serrano, I'm 16 years old, and we're the Toxic Soil Busters. This is a map of Worcester, and all the red and blue dots are children that were found with lead who are within their blood. A majority of the, the density of the kids is mostly in the Maine South and Piedmont area. You can see that how lead affects lower income communities more than other places. When you inhale the lead, it gets into your bloodstream and it gets into your bones. Your body mistakes it for calcium and iron, and you need that to, like, you know, grow and stuff like that. And at a young age, you know, if you're, like, to the day you were born to, like, nine years old, it's a very... It's when your body is increasing and it's still developing. Lead can damage your brain, permanent brain damage. It can um, cause ADD. You know, you can't focus, you don't listen good. You have um, behavior disabilities. Not a lot of adults can add on to like helping deal with it because they're too busy working two or three jobs. That's why I think it's important for the youth to deal with it. Since adults haven't been able to do much, 
we decided to do something about lead. Back in 05, we started the Toxic Soil Busters, a youth-led cooperative business that removes lead from yards. When I started working with the Toxic Soil Busters, I had to get a blood test. They showed blood levels, but it wasn't that high. We went to the library and we found out that Three Deckers had a lot of lead paint, and I was like, well, I live in a Three Decker, and you know, so it's just like, why not get it tested? So we're just gonna do some um, soil sampling, and the reason why we're taking it here and not over there, which we're gonna do later, but it's important because this is um, the drip line, it's called the drip line. It's where the lead paint chipped off and it fell into the soil. This is a, the sonic canner, it's like, it has water in it, and what it does is it has, it has like sound waves that separates like the lead from the soil. Lead is measured in parts per million. Anything over 400 parts per million is considered dangerous. So the reading is almost done, and uh, So that's a 1,256. Whoa, that's pretty high. You ready, Janice? My, my brother's name is Joshua. He's nine. He likes to play outside a lot, and um, you know he doesn't care if like he gets dirty or all muddy. He always comes in the house all muddy after playing outside, but I mean, um, I mean, yeah, I am worried because there's lead in the yard. I'm a toxic soil buster. Just because the paint companies and the government still haven't dealt with it, that doesn't mean we're gonna let it affect my brother. TSB all day, man, you know we got the plan. TSB ain't a business, it's a fame, and we cover up the lead with sand. Or pea stone, low budget landscapers need some service, then pick up the phone, yo. If not, then you risk contracting lead in your bones, yo. Yeah, I said in your bones, yo. Uh. Uh. We do landscaping to make yards uh. safe. One of the techniques we use is called phytoremediation. Uh which means using plants that suck up the lead as they grow. Then we safely dispose of the plants. All we do is build beds, not the kind that you sleep in the ones that your girl you're eating. Uh, pet geraniums next season, throw it in the bin, yo. Lead is a metal like tin, yo. The federal government just gave Worcester a $2 million grant for lead removal. The city has entrusted some of that money to youth, the toxic soil busters, to coordinate de letting soil. Dreams do come true. I believe when adults say that youth can't do certain things, the TSB is a business that is started from youth and can prove them wrong. I don't think anything can stop us. We gotta stop this stereotype, huh? We gotta do this big, let's go! Action. Lead Action Program, which is We Laugh, uh, that funds a lot of our <coughs> landscaping and remediation. Thank you. Uh, what other grants do we get? Do you know? Yeah, we have. We try to. Dive, uh, one of the problems. We'll talk about more about challenges in youth cooperatives later. But yeah. one of the challenges is diversifying our revenue streams and not being uh, reliant on those models. 
and not being on the line on those NGOs or large nonprofits or government grants, but being able to create sustainable businesses in the community so that we can use funds that we create from our business to generate more cooperatives. Um, yeah. So we're going to do a quick go around about different youth cooperatives. Talk to Soul Busters is just one. Um, first, uh, Jonathan's going to tell us a little bit about his experience in Toxic Soil Busters. All right. Um, so like I said, my name is Jonathan, and I used to work for uh, Toxic Soil Buster for a little bit over a year and a half, I would say. Um, I did leave, unfortunately, but I'm still here, and I love to support them, and it's a wonderful thing that they do, and I really am grateful for them because they taught me so many valuable lessons. Um, I'm very proud that I even got the chance to, you know, hang around with these people because they're really awesome. They taught me how to speak in front of crowds like this. Like, honestly, I was pretty shy when I was little, you know, didn't really want to communicate, and now I'm speaking in front of, you know, the people, you know. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, I learned how to eat, how to do uh, landscaping, you know, build raised bed, you know. We used to compete a lot, you know, so like who would build the fastest, you know. So it was a lot of fun, you know, even though it was work. It did open a lot of opportunity. We gave many speeches already in front of like City Hall and to a lot of people. And that's something that, you know, for me at least, you know, and I'm sure other TSB members, you know, gives you a lot of hope, you know, it's that you, people can, you know, do change. You know, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that you have to you know, go to college or, you know, be, be rich or something. You know, you can actually make change by, you know, getting a group together and, you know, really focusing on it and just doing it, you know. So I'm very, you know, grateful for your talk to Soul Buster and Mr. Roots in general. Uh, but yeah, that's basically my experience that I had in you know, talk to Soul Buster. I recommend it to every children of the United States, you know, because it does help you out. It gets you out of the street, you know, and it does wonderful things for you. Seriously, you know, it changes your life. Um, so Toxic Soul Busters was the original program started in 2006, or 2005, 2005. rather. 2005. And uh, we actually, a few years later, we had a spin-off program called Youth in Charge, which focused on a specific neighborhood. We got a grant from a local hospital to do uh, lead remediation work and environmental justice outreach. Uh, Shane's going to tell us a little bit about that particular program. Yeah, so I'm with Youth in Charge. I've been there for a year as um, an adult coordinator. And um, we are the sister organization to TSP, so we do a lot of, of similar work. Um, we also do other environmental justice and organizing work. Um, the area where we've been working is a food desert. Um, people have to take a taxi to go to a grocery store. So we've been doing stuff with uh, organizing around, we've been doing organizing around the building gardens in that area, and we're looking into doing or stuff around healthy weight and lead justice. And we don't have a single <coughs> representative, so I'm also going to represent the newest cooperative that we added just last year called Future Focus Media. Uh, this was, um, <coughs> Soul Busters has long had a video program which produced films like these and the one you saw at the film festival uh, last night. Uh, we won, yeah, this particular video won an EPA national award for environmental justice video. I'm very proud of that. Um, yeah. So Future Focus Media takes youth, both in school youth and out of school youth, and trains them in video production, web editing, uh, those kinds of skills that have real world applications and then can be applied to uh, jobs. The idea is that they go through the program and then begin getting gigs and jobs in different places around the community, especially with a social justice and environmental justice focus, and then giving back to the cooperatives. So it's a lot to push on those kids at the same time. We bring them in and say, this is a cooperative, and we're <coughs> teaching you about video editing and direction and writing. And we're also talking about these social systemic issues, showing them how the power of documentaries can really change the way people think. And so far, we have about, uh, I want to say, four or five youth, and we're going to have a summer institute. We're also planning on having a youth-centered uh, film festival in 2013. And we hope that if you have any youth in your communities that have films they want to share with us, uh, we'd be more than happy to talk to you. First, does anybody have any questions for us about Toxic Soil Busters or Worcester Roots or Youth in Charge? How did you both uh, do all find out about it? Do you do, I mean, is there, uh, I'll say it right there. All right. So the way that I came into, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No. The 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 way I came into it was uh, actually Asa 
blew my mind because uh, he went to my school and he asked the principal, you know, if he can, you know, talk in front of a classroom. And hey, it happened to be one of the classrooms that I was in. And I mean, like the the way he, you know, talked and it's, you know, said everything. I was just like amazed, you know, how like how this no offense, this kid could talk so well, you know, in front of people, you know, and just, you know. And he blew my mind, so I was like, I want to join. And they, you know, they gave applications out, and I, I filled them out, and you know, they called me back, and you know, I, I just got hooked on it. <laughs> Seriously, that's how I came about. How did you? Well, um, in Worcester, there's a center called the Stone Soup Community Center, which was this amazing space where organizations in the community doing ex-con rights, immigrant rights, a bike shop, a kitchen, uh, Food Not Bombs was out of there. All these different organizations were in the same building, and I went to a small. Uh, free school, experimental free school that they were having in the living room of that. And Toxic Soil Busters was upstairs, and I knew all the people so that when that school collapsed and I was looking for a job, that immediately came to mind because I didn't want to just get another job in McDonald's or Burger King. I wanted to do something that really felt like it was not only preparing me for a long career, but not a corporate career, but something that really brought out the kind of like social justice or organizing that even if I didn't have the vocabulary for, I wanted to express. Uh, it was a similar situation for me. I had been connected not just with, I mean, I wasn't very connected with Stone Soup, but I was connected with the solidarity economy in Worcester. And I had worked with other environmental justice organizations before that had had uh, a more, you know, boss and employee structure. And when I had heard about toxic soil busters from Matt and from Asa, I realized that a cooperative was a much more functional way to work as a youth, and that I also wanted to learn all of those principles that are taught in a cooperative, and that you know are taught in toxic soil busters about landscaping, and environmental justice, uh, and so I applied and I got hired, and it's been wonderful ever since. All right, I just want to add this real quick. Um, off topic completely, but how old do you think she is? <laughs> seriously, <laughs> throw a number up. Anyone, seriously. 16. 16? Oh, come on. Yeah, she's 16 years old. <laughs> 16 years old, and she speaks I, 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 okay, <laughs> That's That's incredible, don't you think so? Your honor, a lot of people are. <laughs> I'm just, that, that's, that's something, you know, that makes me pretty happy because, like, kids actually can do something, you know, like, you can speak in front of people, you know, it just, it just takes, you know, a lot of people helping them out at first, of course, and, you know, them dedicating their times. And, you know. How old are the rest of you guys? Uh, I'm 18. I'm 17 July. Oh, so the program is, like, 14 to, like... Whatever age. Yeah, there is no maximum usually age. Usually, if... After 18, they either transition to a staff program or if they go off to college, we try to keep them involved by having them come in and do workshops. One of the, I mean, we like to be critical of our own system. So one of the most serious problems that we have is no other cooperative really has to deal with the kind of every three years a complete worker turnover and the complete yeah. loss of all those skills. So when those youth graduate out of the program, we want to keep them in because like we, I mean, no company can function like that, losing yeah. all those skills every three or four years. So we have them come back, do workshops, stay connected, help us and out. And they're all pleased to do like this. Like even Jonathan, he's yeah. not with us right now, but we brought him back for the conference yeah. so that he can talk and uh, share those kinds of skills. And uh, you know, share those kinds of financial literacy, or public speaking, or design, or landscaping skills that they learned while they were in the program, so that it's not just a job that you have for a summer and lose. It's a community that you buy into. And then once you're a part of that, you can always come back and uh, share that space with us. Um, yeah. I have a question. No, you, can, you can go, that's fine. Um, well, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about like the funding mm -hmm. and <coughs> how... Yeah, it's yeah, been a big issue for us. <laughs> there is a lot of fun. I can talk about that. Okay. So, Toxic Soil Bus was initially conceived as a worker cooperative. However, over the six years that it's been operating, we've discovered that it's not at this point feasible for it to break off as an independent cooperative. Uh, this is for a lot of different reasons. One of them is that Tux Soil Busters is still very much grant dependent. Uh, through the grants that we filed through the Worcester Roots Project from all different kinds of organizations for youth work, environmental work, and cooperative work, and as well as those kinds of governmental grants like the HUD grants and the EPA grant, some of those fell through this year, which means we've had to scale back. But that kind of vulnerability is something we try to work through. However, it's all the other side of that equation is that the Worcester Roots Project isn't a massive nonprofit. It's very small. They have three paid staff. 
And um, so they actually, their funding is very much tied to the toxic soil busters, and they can't afford to have the toxic soil busters split off. So especially with the kind of symbiotic branding that occurred, intentionally and unintentionally, uh, those two are very much linked. One of the things we've been trying to do to have revenue streams that aren't dependent on, talk, um, on those kinds of grants is to incubate a new cooperative. And Shane can talk a little bit more about that. He and I have been on the uh, co-op incubation committee of Worcester Roots Project, uh, working to incubate a landscaping and a lead safe landscaping and lead remediation cooperative called The Diggers after a uh, medieval uh, landless movement of uh, farmers that rose up in rebellion and were eventually exterminated. But we try not to focus on that part. <laughs> we try to stay legal. Focus on the positive part. They were pacifist, uh, anti-authoritarian, very almost like pre-cooperative uh, pre uh, movement. Um, so yeah, that's the answer. We, it's uh, definitely an issue that we try to talk about because, for example, through the summer, we try to get the youth full time, uh, even though that's not possible during the school year. However, that funding got cut by 60% this year, yeah. so we've had to re like reshuffle a lot of money from general stipends funds in order to make sure all our youth could be employed through the summer. The city, oh, I'm sorry. The city usually pays for a lot of it, like um, yeah. like when it comes to the summer. There's like a, at least Worcester has a, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Our local community action council gets grants from the, you know, the state and the. Yeah. Uh, so we, get, we get, so basically all of us can work full time, and you know, toxic soil bus doesn't have to take out so much of the pocket, yeah, you know, out of our own pocket. So. The way we we like, it's still like, part time in 20 hours. Right, we're like when we're doing testing, the way it works is it's like contracted with the city, so like the te if the test results come in and they're way above 400. Um, in theory, it goes through the city and they give us the funds to ready at the yard. So we're basically contract workers, but like um, that process sucks. <laughs> and, um, it takes a long time. <laughs> you know, the city how it works. It's so backed up. Slow and very backed up. And like at this point, it's it doesn't. It's not just um, over 400. It's do they have a young child? Yeah. Like, yeah. They're really prioritizing. Them. At this point, if you don't have a child and your yard is incredibly toxic, they don't want to hear about it. It's only the most dire, extreme straits that you can yeah. get actual grant funds. You can get city funds for. Otherwise, you have to pay out of pocket. It's, it's unfortunate, though. But and even for those like extreme cases, you have to keep calling them and harassing them. So. You know, the more energy that's expended, you know, just trying to pry the money out of the grip of the government, the less time we can focus on actually doing work. So just trying to manage our time well is something we struggled with. Right. Sorry, quickly, in terms of how you're incorporated, is it a nonprofit structure or is it like the Worcester Roots Project is a 501c3 nonprofit. The uh, Toxic Soul Busters is not incorporated as a cooperative. Right now, it's a uh, an entrepreneurial venture uh, incubated inside of the Worcester Roots Project that can legally do business but isn't, doesn't pay like business taxes. Cool. Yes, sir? Uh, what's the relationship between your and nonprofit in terms of some of the uh, administration mm -hmm. responsibilities as a business? Well, Toxic Soil Busters has members that sit on the board of the Worcester Roots Project. And um, for example, me and Shane work closely with the staff collective to, um, to do the kind of management. But the Toxic Soil Busters and Youth in Charge and Future Focus all meet independently and have uh, horizontal democratic consensus-based decision-making that's independent of the Worcester Roots Project. So if the Worcester Roots Project board allocates a certain amount of funds for the toxic soil busters, the toxic soil busters can decide how to use those funds and are not held accountable to the Worcester Roots Project um, in that kind of like day-to-day -day administration. Uh, we do try to keep in touch and make sure we're all on the same page by having that kind of uh, flow of communication between the cooperatives and the nonprofit structure <coughs> to make sure that we don't like have a conflict of vision or there's a, a mis avoid those kinds of miscommunications that can uh, breed conflict. How did you all choose lead abatement? <laughs> well, in 2005, I wasn't there. Yeah, none of my us. Time. Yeah, none of us, yeah, none of us were there at the start. But the Worcester Roots but. Project was interested. We had a few youth that they were talking to about starting some kind of cooperative venture. <coughs> And we have Matt Feinstein over there, who's the founding member of the Toxic Soil Busters, along with uh, two youth, Janice and Sam, that live in Worcester, uh, that have since graduated out of the program. And 
they were just doing research about what the social justice or environmental justice issues in their community were, and they found out about this epidemic of lead poisoning that was in their communities. So they went to the library, they researched methods of remediation, and they heard about this obscure experimentation that was happening in Canada, I think it was, on using scented geraniums to soak up the lead in the soil. And they said, this sounds like, this sounds amazing, because it was this sort of like phytoremediation, using natural methods to deal with these chemical man-made problems, sort of felt right somehow. So they began experimenting with them, they planted, and they saw mixed results, but in some yards they saw um, good improvement in experimenting with these kinds of plants. So out of that, it grew out and expanded into more landscaping work, into doing lead testing, and eventually through increasing their brand name and increasing their presence in the community, they got involved with a lot of different activist centers and sort of uh, expanded from there to what it is now. And does that answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Who are the youth involved in this project? Are we talking, uh, are we talking honor students and um, who are already involved? Let's see. We well, right now there's five. There's five youth in Toxic Cellbusters, and four in YC. I wouldn't say that they're all honor students. No, yeah, definitely not. Um, <laughs> see, um, that we really don't, like, that's, it's like a regular job. You um, don't ask about your school work, like, yeah. that's your business, you know? Yeah. Um, Asa, he was homeschooled, yeah. and um, he... I got my GED, GED. this spring. Um, both me and Haley are out of high school. Yeah, and me. And, and, and Jonathan me, is um, out of high school. Um, <laughs> All other members come from diverse backgrounds. Some of them came from real life youth activist and leadership background, but we also have a lot of youth for whom they just came into this as like a, jo a summer job and then gradually realized that they want to be more part of the cooperative or leadership part of it. How much? Wait, uh, I don't think her question was answered. Do you yeah. mind if I ask a little follow up? No, no. When you're, when you're doing outreach in schools and mm -hmm. stuff, what extent are you targeting youth who, for instance, have survived abuse, right. addiction, incarceration, stuff like that? Right. We do try to outreach to those uh, special communities of color or at-risk youth because we feel like those youth that live in privileged communities aren't don't need us as much because they already have these incredibly extensive support structures and they don't have the kind of uh, dangers or risks associated with them. And that we don't see these at-risk youth I mean, that's such a terrible expression. It sounds like a roll of the die is going to determine their future. But these youth that don't have the advantages, or these underprivileged youth, or these youth that are poor, you know, just to say that, you know, youth that live in violent communities, um, don't need just services, or don't need just people to tell them what's wrong with them, and here's how to fix yourself, or here's the track, here's the, you know, the golden yellow brick road that's going to save you. But they need to say, hey, what's the problems in your community? What do you care about? And what do you want? What force do you want to be in the world? And then create the kind of supportive structures that can allow them to be that. Now, can I ask you a question? I'm sorry. Don't take a person on that. But um, why did you ask the question if uh, did, uh, do we choose because of school, like honor students? Do you think that it makes a big difference? If it, it, does it matter if a student is on, in the honors role or it doesn't? I, I'm just asking you, don't take it wrong. I think it matters like any other attribute. So you I think a broad range of people. So you do think it matters that well, it's good. It's, so what she's saying yeah. is it's good that we outreach to people that aren't on the honor. Oh, okay. Oh, it's all right. That you reach out to. I uh, at first, I thought, <laughs> thought, at first I thought you you wanted like everyone to be yeah. honor students, and I was like. Oh, you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. then there is a situation right there. Yeah, there's a wonderfully <laughs> wide range of diversity yeah. in toxic soil busters. If, if only you could meet all of the people that are in it. It's just. It's it's really also really great to have a diversity like, of language. Absolutely, oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I can speak a little Japanese, but that's not as relevant. They, uh, I speak Spanish, Spanish, Portuguese, and English. And that so. right now, I think we have a uh, tree and Nepali too. In oh yeah, just inside yeah. the toxic soil. And Matt speaks French and everything as well. So like, I mean, it's all over the place. You know, it's like. <laughs> it's, but it's. Um, we have one question here, one question in the back. Um. Yeah. Well. Um. I was wondering um, how, I guess two questions. Firstly, like how um, adults are involved and like how they support you, I guess. Um, like what, you know, what role they play. Um, I'll let you answer that and then I'll ask my follow-up question. But also just FYI, one of the communities that I work with, we, we don't say at risk. We, we've come up with, um, 
sum up human beings in a sound bite, so that when you talk about these views, it shouldn't be short, and it shouldn't be easy, and it shouldn't be packaged, and it should be a dialogue. So it's definitely a good thing that you can't just talk about it as ask risk, or like people of color, or these like nice little boxes of society yeah. which you can you know, put on your shelves. <laughs> So, um, so as, talk about, yeah. yeah, as far as uh, adults in um, the Worcester Roots and Toxic Soil Busters, uh, in Worcester Roots there is a board and a staff collective that is uh, mostly adults, although this, the uh, board all, can also consist of youth. Uh, and because it's uh, a collective or cooperative structure, uh, there there isn't a, uh, a certain, like, uh, you know, Employee, like boss, kind of, kind of flow for the uh, for the adults. You know, we all work collectively and have collective decision making, and we all have the same buying power. Right. So, I mean, there's really no like structural difference between uh, us youth uh, or adults that are also in the co-op. <laughs> but we do workshops okay. uh, like every Tuesday, um, and we also, uh, I mean. We do teachings through like, you know, the the actual less soil remediation. Actually, one of my first days was uh, a, a workshop on on the soil testing. Um, uh, Asa is the outreach and education coordinator. He might be able to speak more on that because he's uh, he's really the one who uh, goes out and, and teaches people about toxic soil busters and about what we do and uh, how they can get involved. Haley's our new testing coordinator, and it's getting all our incredibly messy files in order and doing an amazing job. I, I was actually also wondering less training about toxic right, soil busters and more saying. sort of like absolutely. You know. Maybe Matt wants to speak for that. Okay. Just uh, that we we have a kind of a capitalism 101 workshop. Okay. We do um, environmental justice yeah. uh, workshop in, in general. We do. Um, uh, public speaking, and we have a kind of a political economy thing we do as well. Um, we uh, are part of a, a coalition that's put a lot of anti-racism and undoing racism week-long um, trainings on, um, and engage a lot of our uh, board members to, you know, co-op members in, in those. Um, and a lot of the curriculum is on our website at worcesterroots.org. So, yeah. We also, I feel like a lot of toxic soil busters have to learn in the process of giving the training almost. Yeah. Because this spring we had what's called a community organizing training where we invited members of the community to join us for, I think it was a stretch of like seven Thursdays, to come in and learn about a wide variety of really practical, focused community organizing tactics and strategies. And we did things like power mapping, door-to-door -door knocking, and it's definitely a sort of holistic approach to trying to create people that are agents of change and community organizers. And we don't see this as being like a very narrow kind of, you know, just scientific skills. Like, I mean, it's invaluable that those ki you have those kinds of skills so that they can get <laughs> jobs, you know? If all you know is how to like talk to people, that's great, but it's also great to be have, have those concrete skills. And we try to put that in a larger social context as well. I mean, as far as sustainability uh, for toxic soil busters, I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really still like in the uh, process of going through all of us and like us doing meetings and figuring out how we can really sustain it. Uh, so that's still in the planning process, I suppose. But we, I mean, we definitely have talked about it. Talked about mm -hmm. it. And we, have a lot, and we have a lot of like resources or ideas that we've built up that we'd love to you know, share if you guys I mean, there aren't a lot of people that have similar struggles because you have unique uh, challenges that we face. For example, like lack of experience, uh, quick turnover, um, difficulty. And a lot of the times, adults, I mean, I guess it's a problem with adults too, adults coming into cooperatives without knowing what cooperatives are. But like the amount of time that it takes to train those youth to the point where they can, uh, like not everyone's a Haley, not everyone can just come in and start doing the first day. 
So yeah, it's definitely something. Um, we are going to do some breakout sessions around how youth in your communities uh, can be impacted. We thought we'd do some one-to-ones, uh, just talking about how your work intersects with youth, or if it doesn't, how you would like to see it intersect, or if it has absolutely no relation to youth, then just you know how you feel about movement in general. Different other co-op sort of startup, one being like a community bike shop, and so we were just decided to take this time to think about ways. Um, Ways of supporting other sort of bike related things in the area, like um, there's a cool like bike camp program in Holyoke, which is right near us, um, but also thinking about um, this project that's sort of in the early stages of development and thinking like how cool it would be to have a big youth cooperative component to a bike shop um, and ways to like really harness that energy and um, you know, start, like, be able to harness bike safety, bike mechanics skills um, with youth would be really cool. I'm, I'm really excited because Full Circles Foundation is, is basically the organization that I work with. It's an empowerment track for girls, and, and we've been trying to figure, well, the plan was to have it self-sustaining, to right. be self-sustaining eventually, you know, five years, five to ten years. <laughs> um, and so seeing seeing youth, you know, the idea was, you know, have to just have a student-owned, Cooperative, the surplus of which is reinvested in our non-revenue generating programs for our middle and our, our elementary and middle girls. Um, so the fact that this is happening is, is, is just really cool and I would love to talk to you all more about, um, obviously you all are not incorporated as a, as a LLC or as a, as a cooperative, but um, sort of in terms of the decision making that might happen around the incorporation of that, you know, is that going to be totally empowered or is it going to be with adult help and, and, and how, how are those, that, that, those dynamics, how are they going to play out? conversation was this, this gap that we see in the, the youth and young adults in our lives between creative interests and real life. Mm -hmm. um, I teach at a community college and I have enormously creative people, people who are working in the arts, people who are budding entrepreneurs in my classes and then I say let's think creatively about a project mm -hmm. and I get no this is school we don't think creatively here uh, <laughs> it's, it's awful um, so <laughs> what I want to do is uh, transform our student run business into a cooperative um, at the college that I work at and I'm part of the Boston cooperative here in Boston mm -hmm. and we are working to um, establish a few different programs mm -hmm. Uh, daytime programs for what will be a venue at night, and one of them is a program for youth coming out of tough circumstances and tough structural obstacles, integrating the arts and personal growth, and um, perhaps some job training. I'm not sure, I hadn't thought about running it as a cooperative before this panel, uh, running it as a sub cooperative to the cooperative before this panel. So, this is really exciting to think about. Thank you. I think one of the most destructive things about the capitalist system that we live under is this artificial division between creative acts and work and life, or seeing education as an anteroom to real life as opposed to being coeval with it or inextricably linked with it. And that these kinds of boxing or compartmentalizing of our lives where this is the place where it's work. So my only role here is to try to please and appease the people I work for enough that I can keep my check. And this is the place where I can entertain myself, in which case I don't have to produce anything because this is my time. I shouldn't produce anything or I shouldn't try to create anything because this is my time to just react, relax and detox from that incredibly soul crushing uh, experience of just trying to like get by in these kinds of uh, hierarchical systems. So feeling like a more complete way of life where there isn't any division between creative thinking or like what you try to, or what we talk about is like right livelihood, like having a way of living and being able to sustain yourself that nurtures you and isn't just this thing, not just like, I mean we all say working to live, but it isn't just like working so that you can live, it's you know, your work is your life, you know? and not saying that you have to pour all your energy or all your time into your work, but that it isn't these kinds of like barriers that would um, 
to prevent that kind of creative growth or inspiration happening in those kinds of work contexts? One big part of like also the <laughs> why I believe in youth cooperatives is, is because youth are our future, right? Why are we educating them and bringing them into these wonderful, wonderful opportunities? You know, that's like that's crazy to me that that it's like you know I mean although you know ah, adults are great, <laughs> sorry guys, uh, <laughs> you know you guys are youth too, right? Were you given these opportunities? Do you wish that you were given these opportunities? Because at a young age, you're at that stage of development where you can learn so much in such a little time. And uh, I think it's really important for you, are you to absolutely I'm more susceptible to bad influences. I think it's really important with these guys. <laughs> for you to learn all of these uh, wonderful skills and trades and uh, cooperative systems. That's why we're here. That's so true. Yeah. And they're not just, you know, I mean, they are like, we can talk about them being leaders of the future, which, I mean, of course they are, because they're going to get older, but they're also, you know, now. Leaders right now. Yeah. Absolutely. They don't have, it isn't like, well, we'll train these youth so that they can be effective in our organization when they grow up. <laughs> well, <laughs> what is the voice that they have yeah. right now that we can learn from? True. I mean, well, uh, future focus, but there's definitely overlap inside of that. Mm -hmm. And we try to outreach to other youth groups so that we don't work in isolation. I don't think one of the things that we're trying to do is start this multi-generational landscaping cooperative where youth can be trained inside of these cooperatives like Toxic Soil Busters and Youth in Charge. And then when they have that training, both of like, you know, understanding of like broader systems and those kinds of oppression and hierarchical and what it means to work inside of a cooperative, they can work with um, adults and learn those kinds of landscaping skills in a really like truly cooperative atmosphere because it's hard to teach people, this is something we butt up against, trying to teach people about cooperatives while we're not like a sustainable business cooperative, like while being inside of like what's almost a grant run program, sort of having that model saying, hey, this is what a worker cooperative is supposed to look like and we're training you to be a part of that.